Hello and welcome. This is Abigail Perillo from the Trust Program Development Team. We would like to thank you for listening in on this Trust webinar, Treatment of Influenza. We'd also like to thank Santa Fe Pasture for making this webinar possible. So today we'll be, we will be discussing the effects of flu treatment and identifying when to give the flu vaccine. As well, we will be comparing different treatments for different patients. And I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Kraft. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. My name is Dr. Brian Kraft. I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician at Duke University Medical Center, and I attend in the medical intensive care unit where we regularly take care of patients uh, with complications of the flu. The treatment is um, largely supportive in uncomplicated influenza infections. It's most important that patients are getting adequate rest, taking time off of work, um, ensuring uh, sufficient hydration and intake of fluids to avoid dehydration, and taking over-the-counter pain medications such as acetaminophen or ibuprofen for symptomatic relief. There are a number of FDA-approved medications, however, for influenza infection. This slide shows the four currently FDA-approved medications to treat influenza that are recommended for the 2019-2020 influenza season. The first is oseltamivir, and this can be prescribed in a pill or liquid suspension, and is FDA-approved for patients two weeks and older, and is the preferred drug for pregnant patients. The second is zanamivir. This is an inhaled drug and it should be avoided in patients with chronic lung disease like asthma or COPD as it can, can, can cause bronchoconstriction. The next drug is paramivir. This is an IV infusion, single dose uh, medication, and it's approved for uh, patients uh, ages two and up and is generally given in the inpatient setting. And the final drug is biloxivir marboxyl, and this is a single dose pill that's FDA approved for patients that are ages 12 years and up, uh, but it should be avoided in pregnant or breastfeeding mothers or in patients with severe influenza complications because it has not been sufficiently studied in those populations. These medications do not replace common sense measures, um, including getting the influenza vaccine. The vaccine is probably the most important um, preventative measure that a patient can take to protect themselves from either getting the flu or having severe complications. But the medications can be effective in reducing uh, severity of symptoms, the risk of complications and the duration of symptoms, and are most effective when taken within 48 hours of symptom onset. But that should not necessarily discourage use if prescribed or uh, after 48 hours. The question of chemoprophylaxis is, is a common question. Who should get uh, chemoprophylaxis uh, in patients that are exposed to others with the flu but don't exhibit flu symptoms themselves. It's important to note that this is not a substitute for, for influenza vaccination, which is still the most important preventative measure a patient can take to protect themselves. And generally speaking, chemoprophylaxis is not recommended for most patients after exposure to influenza. However, there are specific patient groups where it is um, appropriate uh, to consider. Um, those include patients with chronic heart disease, such as congestive heart failure, chronic lung disease, such as asthma, COPD, or pulmonary fibrosis, chronic kidney or liver disease, patients on dialysis, and those who are immunocompromised, such as uh, drug-induced chemotherapy, diabetes, certain cancers, such as leukemia, lymphoma, and patients with HIV AIDS. All right, well, that's all we have for today. Thank you, Dr. Kraft, for a great presentation, and thanks, everyone, for listening in.